Church, what's up? How we doing? Man, so good to see you. How are you tonight? Good? Doing okay? Hey, special shout out to some of our friends tuning in from across the nation. Porch Live Midland. Yeah, Porch Live Dayton in Port Slav, Des Moines. Really glad you guys are joining us. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of what God is doing, not only here in our city, but in your city too. God can genuinely meet with anyone, anywhere, and at any time. And so we're really glad that you would trust us with your Tuesday. Well, just a few years ago, Brooke and I were traveling to Colorado for a wedding in a remote city called Lake City. We'd never been there before. But we knew by the time we landed in Denver, it was approximately a four hour drive from the airport uh, to the destination. And so uh, we land in Denver, we make our way over to the rental car agency, we get into our rental car and uh, right as I'm pulling out of the parking lot, uh, I stop the car and I look over to my wife and I say, hey, we should just pray. You know, we got four hours in the car together. We should pray that over the course of the next four hours, uh, God would meet with us. And so I prayed this specifically. I said, God, as we drive today, would you make yourself known to us along the way? And then I, uh, I proceeded to hit the gas, pull out of the parking lot, and we uh, traversed, our, uh, traversed our way to our destination in Lake City. Uh, one hour passed by, two hours passed by, three hours passed by, and then four hours passed by. And as I looked around, I could tell, man, we're, we, it doesn't really feel like we're getting close to Lake City. I've never been there before. I don't know what it looks like. But uh, it doesn't seem like we're actually getting as close as we should be by this point. Brooke, where are we at right now? And she, uh, she proceeds to look at the GPS and she realizes that we are up. Uh, we're still three hours away uh, from our destination, uh, which was horrifying to learn in the moment because uh, by the time we had learned this news, we could have already been there. Like we could have already shown up and said hello to the bridal party and uh, gotten into our room and checked in nice and cozy. But instead, we still had three hours in the car. And I love my wife. But that's seven hours of total driving. And that's a long time behind the wheel. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we, we look around and I am, I'm traumatized by the fact that we still have this long to go. And so I start to wonder to myself, what happened? And then I realized uh, it was Apple Maps, you know, uh, it led us astray. It took us down the longest foreseeable route possible from Denver to our destination. We had made a grievous mistake. We did not choose the quickest route. Instead, uh, we chose a long route unbeknownst to us. And so in this moment, I'm frustrated, frustrated with the situation, frustrated with my wife. I'm frustrated with the fact that Colorado even has a route that's this long to get to this city when it's not necessary. I am so frustrated that our GPS has taken us down a road, the likes of which we never had to go. And yet it was a road, the likes of which God very clearly wanted us to drive down. Because as we made our way to Lake City, down the scenic route, what we found is, uh, is we were trapped in a field of wildflowers in bloom, crystal lakes cascading through thousands of acres all at sunset. Because this route that we did not choose for ourselves, but God chose for us, actually took us into the Rio Grande National Forest. And it was there that God decided to answer my prayer. He was making himself known to us along the way. Now, why do I tell you that? Because over the course of the last several weeks, we here at the porch have been working through a series called Essential uh, that has felt a lot like this journey of mine in Colorado. Uh, we've been talking about the one thing that brings everything into focus. That's been our destination to talk about the one thing. And yet it has taken us now five total weeks of time to unpack one thing, which feels a little bit like a bait and switch. You're like, wait, I showed up for one thing and I've gotten over a month's worth of teaching. Like, what is with this? This shouldn't be so difficult. Like, this is the most important thing. And yet it's taking so long for you to explain to us. I feel like I've shown up week after week after week. And I feel like I'm learning the same thing over and over and over. Why is it taking so long? And the reason is because that which is most important according to the scriptures, the one thing that God wants you to know, uh, which is that we should aspire to see as much of him as possible. We don't arrive at that quickly, but instead that's a process 
that takes a long time and often leads us down a road much further than we initially intended or expected. This is why we've been journeying through the series. We have been looking at these one thing statements. One thing I ask, one thing I lack, one thing I do, one thing I need, one thing I know, because those statements reinforce the importance of seeing God for who he is. That's the most important thing in the Bible, to get your eyes on him, to set your gaze on him, to see him and as much of him as possible, which takes time. And tonight, we're arriving at the end of our destination. Because tonight, we find ourselves on the fifth one thing statement, which is in John chapter 9. So if you have a Bible, you can grab your Bible. You can turn with me to John chapter 9. While you're doing that, what you need to know is this. As we turn to this story, we're going to catch up to Jesus in Jerusalem. It's in chapter 7 that he travels to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. What you need to know about the Feast of Tabernacles is it was one of three annual feasts. The people of, uh, the people of Jerusalem, uh, the people of Israel, they would celebrate every single year that was a pilgrimage feast. So that meant that they would celebrate this feast by way of traveling back to the holy city. That native Jews spread all over the globe. They would return to Jerusalem in this moment, which meant that the city was busting at the seams with people. Like there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, travelers that are native Jews that have returned to the city for the Feast of Tabernacles. And this feast, it's like a giant party. Like everyone has high spirits because they've shown back up to celebrate God's provision of the nation of Israel over the course of the last several centuries. That's what's happening in this story. We catch up to Jesus in a moment where, uh, where he's surrounded by thousands. People are setting up booths. They're in temporary shelters. The streets are littered with folks. And in this scene, we see in verse 1 that as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, no, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. So just briefly, we're gonna work all the way through this passage, but I do wanna just stop here for a minute uh, because we need to see what's happening. The disciples, they see this man, this man born blind, sitting on the side of the road and they ask Jesus an odd line of questioning. Like, hey, uh, this guy is pretty messed up. He's in a weird situation. Whose fault is it? Is it his fault that he sinned against his parents or is it his parents' fault? Which feels strange to us. And yet, what we just need to know is it actually accords with Jewish tradition. Uh, you see, according to Jewish tradition, what we know is that at the time of conception, uh, it was believed that a fetus could choose between two different inclinations, one good and one evil. If it chose an evil inclination, then it would do things. It would kick in the womb and it would make the pregnancy really hard and there'd be lots of morning sickness. And the belief would be that uh, that fetus has chosen an evil inclination and thus uh, it stands likely to suffer some sort of defect as it comes into the world. This was one belief. The alternative is that God was revisiting the errors or mistakes of the parents upon that child. That, hey, you guys, y'all messed up in the past. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my pound of flesh from the little guy. You know, like that was kind of God's perspective according to Jewish tradition. And yet Jesus, he knows that this is what they're thinking. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like that's not, that's not what happened here. He says, no, it's not the man, nor is it the parents' fault. They're not the cause of his condition. His flaws, they don't exist to perpetuate his shame. His flaws exist to promote God's glory. That's what he says. That his pain, it's not pointless. It's purposeful. God wants to use him to make himself known. Uh, which I think is important for us to just take time and unpack really quickly here because some of you have walked in here tonight and you have some imperfections, some blemishes, some deficiencies uh, that you think, man, God you just don't love me. Like this has happened to me, I guess because of something I did in the past. And yet what you need to know by way of this quick text is that your imperfections, that thing which you feel is so messed up in your life, it's not the result of some divine displeasure God has with you. That that's not the case. No, instead what this text is telling us is that there's no karma in the Christian life. Like there's no, what you give is what you get. 
You know, you reap what you sow. What goes around comes around. Like that's not a philosophy in the Christian worldview. No, the Christian worldview is not that we get what we deserve. It's that we get what we do not deserve. We get what Christ deserves. What does Christ deserve? The love of God. A love that's not transactional. That's not quid pro quo. Hey, you give me a little bit of that, I'll give you a little bit of this. That's not the kind of love that God has for his people. It's not the kind of love that he has for his son. He has an unconditional love, which is ours in Christ. We get grace, unmerited favor. And Jesus is using this man's story tonight to help us realize that his blemishes, they're but a canvas upon which God is going to paint a beautiful portrait for us to see, which is why he does what he does next. Verse six, having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Now, Jesus's treatment of this man is very different than the disciples. And uh, it's very different than anyone's treatment of this man, right? None of us would treat this man this way because it's not common uh, to just smear mud into people's faces. This is something that's very unique to Jesus and yet is very purposeful to Jesus. You see, the disciples, they engage this man's condition as fodder for a theological discussion. Man, that guy looked like, he looks like he did something wrong. So what do you think caused it? That's not what Jesus does. He doesn't see his condition as just fodder or fuel for theological discussion. He sees it as an opportunity for new revelation. He sees it as a chance to present both to this man and to the rest of the crowd, the watching world in that moment, who God is. What we said at the beginning, the most important thing is to see as much of God as possible. Jesus is looking at this man and he's saying, this is perfect. I can help them see God through this guy's example. And so Jesus takes us to our first point. He proves to us through this man that he will meet us where we are so we can see him as he is. Jesus meets us where we are so we can see him as he is. That's why he spits on the ground, he makes some mud and he smears it on the guy's eyes. Like this isn't a long lost treatment for blindness. Uh, This is something that Jesus is very uniquely and specifically doing for this guy. There's an important detail in this story. This man was born blind, okay? The author, John, really wants us to get it. He wants us to know, hey, this guy was born blind. It says that he was blind 13 times over the course of this entire chapter. And it details that it was, he was blind from birth over five times in this chapter because he needs us to know. Jesus isn't just curing a very general kind of blindness. He's curing a very specific kind of blindness. It was a blindness that was from birth meaning that this man's issue is that he was created wrong. Like his problem isn't that he lost vision, it's that he never had vision. The issue is that he was created blind. So catch this, what does Jesus do? He stoops down and he meets the man where he is. He takes from the dust of the ground He forms new life upon which he smears to this man's eyes. And instead of just giving restoration to his sight, he brings recreation to his sight. Jesus becomes the God of creation. Do you see it? Like that's what he's doing in this moment. And what's amazing about this is as Jesus goes along, he doesn't just meet this guy where he is. He meets this guy where everyone is because he performs a miracle the likes of which the likes of which would have put everybody on notice because he performs what we know as a messianic miracle. The Old Testament talks about three specific miracles that only the Messiah would have been able to perform. Those three miracles, number one is cleansing a leper because to cleanse a leper, you would have made yourself unclean, which the Messiah couldn't be. The Messiah had to be clean. Number two was casting out a mute demon. You see the proper Jewish methodology for exorcism required that you cast a demon out by its name. That's how you had authority over it. And yet if the demon was mute, if it couldn't speak, then you couldn't know its name and you had no authority to cast it out. Yet the Messiah would be able to do that anyways. And then the third messianic miracle is that you would be able to heal a man born blind because this isn't just an act of restoration. It's an act of recreation. 
It's restoring something, recreating something that was never there to begin with. You see, by the time we reach this story, Jesus has already performed two of those miracles. He's done the first two. And as he comes to this moment with this man, he performs the third, which puts everybody on red alert. Like it freaks everybody, the ever living out. They see that he doesn't just heal this blind man. Blind people were getting healed by Pharisees, right? Like this was something that rabbis could do at some level of infrequency. No, Jesus does something that has never been done in the history of humanity. And in so doing, he proves I'm the Messiah. It's kind of like the process you go to get verified on Instagram, right? That's what Jesus is doing. He's trying to earn, not pay for, earn that little blue check mark. He wants everyone to know, I'm the real deal. Like, I'm the genuine article. And so what does he do? He does exactly what you would do on Instagram. Like, he presents that he's authentic. He represents, uh, like, what does it mean? you, You have to represent a real and genuine person. Jesus is that. Like, we can historically verify the fact that Jesus is authentically real. Uh, There has to be a level of uniqueness to the person's account. You have to represent the unique presence of that person. One account is allowed per person, just meaning you've actually got to be you. Jesus is not trying to be anybody that he's not. He's very content in his identity, very secure individual. So he's uniquely himself and no one else. He also, he presents a complete account. Like he demonstrates to everyone that yes, he is public. He does have a bio, hello, I'm the son of God. Uh, He has a profile photo. You can catch me on the Galilean seaside and I'm active, I'm out here, I'm doing things. I'm teaching, I'm performing miracles. Uh, Jesus is very completely himself. And then lastly, he's notable. (laughs) Like he is... Noteworthy, people want to know him. He is a well-known figure. He has a brand and a persona, the likes of which sends people flocking. You know, like they want to get as close to this guy as they can. They are fascinated by the authority with which he teaches. Jesus is verifying for everyone, hey, I am the Messiah and to leave no room for doubt, I'm going to perform these miracles so that way you know I am he and no one else is. Because this is a title, again, you don't buy, but you earn. It's something that has to be proven. And Jesus is doing that in this moment. He's showing that I'm the literal king. Like I'm the anointed one. I'm the deliverer, savior of God's chosen people, Israel. That's who I am. That's what he's proving to everybody by way of this moment. He's the one that people have been waiting for. That stories have been told about, that prayers have been lifted to, that hope hinges upon. That's who Jesus Christ is. And in so doing this miracle, yes, he's meeting this man where he's at. But he's meeting everyone where they're at too. Catch this. This is amazing. Jesus, he meets this blind man where he is. What's this man need? He needs recreation. He can't see. He's never been able to see So what does Jesus do? He stoops to his level and he performs the miracle in a way that demonstrates he is the creator God. What about the crowds? What do they need? He meets them where they are. He performs a miracle the likes of which they all had been anticipating. They had all been waiting for. He performs a miracle that demonstrates he is not just a teacher, a prophet, a nice guy, a moral example to follow, a revolutionary leader. No, he is the Messiah. And not only that, the Pharisees in the story, what does Jesus do? He performs a miracle on Sabbath. And not just any Sabbath, a high Sabbath, a festival Sabbath, a really important day. He performs it on a day that was intended for rest and that sends the Pharisees up in arms because he wants to prove to them, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Do you see it? In this one moment, he meets everyone right where they are so they can see him exactly as he is. Which is why God brought some of you here tonight. Like you've not walked into this room and fooled God into seeing you as something other than you're not. Like you've not come in here and cleaned yourself up enough that God's like, yeah, man, you're looking good. You know, like, no, you walked in here tonight and he knows you exactly as you are in your inmost self. Not, not like this guy, not blind and begging, but burdened all the same. And what he wants to do for you 
is exactly what he does for this man. He wants to meet you where you are that you might see him as he is. So for some of you, he knows you are overwhelmed by the approval of others. Like you just want people to like you. Like you'll do anything. I'll compromise my character. Like what do I got to do? What do I got to sell? Where do I got to be? What do I need to say? You'll do anything because you just want people to approve of you. And Jesus is like, calm down. I'm a friend that's as close as a brother. That's what Galatians 3.29 tells us. Some of you, you are trapped in addiction. You are enslaved to your sin. You have cravings, hungers, appetites, desires, the likes of which you have prayed would go away. And yet they are still there waiting for you early in the morning and late into the evening. You are trapped in an addiction. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm a wonderful counselor. I can help you through that. Colossians, or Isaiah 9, 6. Some of you, you're desperate for things to get better in your job, in your relationship with your family, amongst your parents, in your friendships, whatever it is. You're just desperate for things to get better. God, it seems like nothing will ever actually improve. And yet he's looking and he's saying, hey, you're not hopeless. You have me. I'm the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 27. Some of you, you're haunted by past mistakes. You think back to that thing you did, not just yesterday, not just last week, not just last month, but years ago. And you're still carrying it with you. You're haunted by something that happened so long ago. And yet he's looking at you and he's saying, no, no, no. There's no sin which I will not forgive. Luke 23, 24. Some of you, you're not just thinking about the past. You're afraid of the future. It freaks you out. You don't know what's going to happen out there. And so what you do is you just sit and dwell and worry and complain right here. And yet your fear of the future is something Jesus looks at and he says, no, no, no. You don't need to worry about what's ahead. I will take care of it. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. John 14, 26. Some of you, you are enslaved to secrets. You feel you can never share. There is some hidden sin some forbidden shame that God, if it ever got out into the light of day, you'd lose your job, you'd lose your relationship, your family would disown you, your community would outright expose you. You can't, you can't get it out in the open. No one can ever know. I'm going to the grave with this thing. I'll never share this secret I have. And yet Jesus is looking at you and saying, no, I am a savior that has come to rescue you from that. Luke 19, 10. Some of you tonight, you've been walking with God for a long time. You're comfortable in spaces like this. You know all the lyrics of the songs we sing. You raise your hands in the right moments. And yet you're, you're spiritually flatlining. And you're doubtful things will ever return to the way they were at first. Jesus welcomes all who are weary and heavy laden. That's, right. That's what Matthew 11 says. And to the last of you, your sin's not hidden in secret. It has been laid bare for all to see. You walk into rooms like this and just by way of your presence Entering the doorway, you feel exposed and vulnerable amongst the people like the porch. Jesus looks at you and he says, I'm Emmanuel. I'm with you. You're not alone. You're welcome here. Jesus knows your condition. And he's come close anyways. He wants to meet you where you are, that you might see him as he is. That's what he does for this man, and that's what he wants to do for you. But there's a catch. Jesus will complicate your life to clarify your vision. <laughs> he will complicate your life to clarify your vision. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Listen, that's a tough bit to sell. I'll admit it, but it's true. I've got to give it to you straight. This is what we learn in this story. Like Jesus, he not only wants you to see him, he wants you to see him clearly, bing, like he wants it to be 20-20 vision. 
He wants you to get all of him and more. He wants you to have the full array of who he is as a person, which means he will complicate your life to clarify your vision. Why do parents give their children chores? Why do they unnecessarily complicate their lives? Because without them, they're spoiled and entitled and self-interested and a pain upon this world, you know? No, they give them chores because that's where they learn responsibility. Like that's where they grow in character. That's where they build some sense of maturity. They grow in gratitude. That's why they're given chores. That's why my dad drug me to our family farm and taught me how to cut firewood as a boy. When all of my friends on Saturday mornings were snuggled nice in their beds and watching Saturday morning cartoons, I was out there <laughs> in the cold of winter, <laughs> just swinging that ax, just working it, you know? Why did my dad do that to me? Because he cared about me. He didn't want me to be like them. <laughs> he wanted me to be better. He wanted to complicate my life, to clarify my vision. Yes, he wanted to teach me things. He wanted to grow my character. He wanted to like help me learn responsibility. But it was in the complication that I not only got a vision for those things, I got a vision for him. I got to learn my dad. I got to get to know him. I got to understand his character. I got to learn from his example. And in the process, I learned what it meant to navigate the hard together. That's what Jesus is doing with this guy. Like he complicates his life. Jesus tells him to go and to wash in the pool of Siloam, which really doesn't mean much to us. Can we just be clear on that? Like we probably don't have much grasp of ancient Jewish geography. This just sounds like, hey, he saw him at the temple and he invited him. Hey, buddy, let's just, I'll take you by the hand. Come on, you know, like we'll just walk over here to the pool of Siloam, put some mud, wipe it off. And you're going to see, you know, like that's what we feel like this is. But that is not the case. If you go and you look at historical maps, what you realize is this is a half mile journey down a 400 foot declined pitch on one of the three busiest days in Jerusalem. That's cruel. That is unusual punishment. Jesus, why would you tell a blind man to do that? That is hard enough for regular people. I know folks that can't make that kind of hike today. And yet you're asking someone who can't even see to traverse that sort of terrain. That feels crazy. And yet Jesus cares too much to not complicate his life. You see, Jesus is doing this for a very specific purpose. Like, couldn't he just snap his fingers give but a word and give him his sight back? Of course, like no doubt Jesus could do that. But therein lies the significance to this story. Jesus is less concerned with this man's physical sight and he is more concerned with his spiritual sight. He is less concerned with the eyes of his head and more concerned with the eyes of his heart. That's what Jesus' aim is. And that's his aim for us too. Second Corinthians 5, 7, for we, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. John 20.29, 20, from Jesus himself, he says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus could have solved this man's blindness in but a moment. But the blindness of his heart that took a little bit more time. I know this lesson really well. When my wife and I, Brooke, moved to Houston, uh, we went to work with young adults there. People, the exact same stage of life as you. As we made our way to Houston, I was pumped. I was so excited. Like I had been working in college ministry and cutting my teeth and in smaller ways. But for the first time, I was going to get to lead and teach and shepherd God's people. And I was amped. Like I was ready to like kick butt and take names. You know, I've walked in, I was like, here I am. And yet I was the one whose butt got kicked. I was the name that got taken. You know, it was so much harder than I expected, especially in my first year. And I remember at the end of year one, looking, looking up to God and being like, why? Like, God, why would you do this to me? And it's one of the best lessons I've ever learned. He taught me in that season, Kylan, 
I will take you places you would never choose to go to teach you those things you need to know. I will lead you into places you would never choose, and yet it will be those places that you'll never take back. You see, it was through the pain, not despite it, but through the pain that I learned to trust God. Trust him with my life. Trust him with my future. Trust him with my family. And in the process of doing so, I got a clearer vision of him. Friends, God will complicate your life to clarify your vision. He wants you to know him so much so that he will inconvenience your life and he will disrupt your plans. Does that mean it's easy to handle those moments in the future now that we know that? No, not at all. Like I was just thinking about this guy's story, you know? Like this is a hard ask. Don't you think during his journey to Salome, he probably thought, why am I even doing this? Like, this is so hard. Like, I can't even see. Jesus, you couldn't have picked a closer pool. There are plenty in Jerusalem for you to choose. Why would you pick Salome? Why are you sending me down this path to this place? Why couldn't you pick something easier? And not only that, Jesus, like, the thing you're trying to do, it's something that no one's ever done before. Like, I'm going to be the first one. Hello, everyone. I'm the man more blind that was healed, you know. History, count my name. It was me. No, that's not going to be the case. This feels crazy. Why would he do this? Why does this man press on? For this reason, I think, I think he was desperate enough to keep going. I think he was weary of the hopelessness. I think he was tired of his circumstance and he heard from one man a voice and a truth that sounded like the God he had heard for so long say, I can help you take this and go there. And so he did, he got up and he moved. You see, desperation is a great motivation. It'll move you forward. It'll keep you going. Some of you tonight, like I think that you're in this place Like amidst the heart of whatever it is you're enduring, the pain of whatever you're feeling, some of you, you are desperate enough like this man in this seat that you're sitting in tonight to humble yourself and just say, Jesus, I don't know if you can fix me. I don't know if you can heal me. I don't know if you can help me. But God, I know I can't. So I might as well try. Where's Salome? What can I lose? Wrong question. It's not what can you lose because you can't lose a thing by trusting in Jesus. It's what can you gain because you can gain everything. Which brings me to my third point. One touch from God changes everything. One touch from God changes absolutely everything. That's what happens in this story for this guy. Look, look at how the rest of the passage unfolds. It starts with an interrogation by the Pharisees. It says the Pharisees, they get wind of what happened, that Jesus is out here and he's performing these miracles. And rightly so, as the religious leaders, he's performed enough of these messianic miracles that they should investigate. But they don't just investigate, they interrogate this guy. Like there's some pride, there's some ego, there's some platform here that they're worried Jesus is encroaching on. And so they gather this guy and they say this, they brought, the, uh, they brought to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and he opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, who's not so blind anymore, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. You see, they can't make sense of it. They are so dissatisfied with this guy's answers that they go, and we won't read it for the sixth time, they go from interrogating him to interrogating his parents. You know, if he's not gonna tell us the truth, bring in mom and dad. They will tell us the truth. Is he suspect? Should we trust him? Is he believable? 
no, okay. Like that's what they're trying to just find a way, a, a loophole, a path towards manipulating around this situation. And yet it says there's division among them. They cannot agree. And so they have him come back. And what happens is the interrogation, it escalates. It moves from interrogation to intimidation, which is what we see in verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, which is ironic. We know that this man is a sinner, talking about Jesus. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. But one thing, there it is. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already. Are you not listening? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? I kind of like this guy, you know, throwing a little jab, a little sarcasm in the mix. You can feel the tension in this moment rising. Like the Pharisees, they are openly dissatisfied with the man's claims. Like they're not just behind hushed doors talking to each other and saying, we can't make sense of this. They are looking at him and they're saying, we can't make sense of this. This doesn't compute. And yet what happens as he stands before the religious leaders and they're not only interrogating him, they are intimidating him. He doesn't back down. He does not give ground. He doesn't bend. He doesn't bow. He doesn't break. He stands stalwart. Why? Because one touch from God changes everything. Which raises an important question for us. Why is this his reaction? He was blind. What do you think he wanted to see? He got it. Like he had already gotten the thing he wanted. And so he's in the middle of this interrogation, in the process of this intimidation, and he has his sight. In the midst of this conflict, why doesn't he just plead the fifth? Throw Jesus under the bus. Sorry, man, it's you or me. You know, why does he go down with the ship when he could just enter the trade portal, you know, swap teams? and leave Jesus behind and join these guys. He has his sight. He has what he wants. Why does he stand in allegiance to Jesus? Because, and this is big, and I don't need you to miss this, one touch from Jesus, it didn't just change something in this guy's life. It changed everything in this guy's life. Which is a really confronting thought for some of us here tonight. Because if we can be honest with ourselves, some of us just want Jesus to change something. Like, Jesus, I don't need you to change everything in my life, but I just need you to change something. Like, my job, my paycheck, my bank account, my position in the office, maybe move me completely from this city to that city. My relationship status would be amazing. Can you help me change my body? That'd be great, too. We just wanted to change something. Maybe it's not a tangible something. Maybe it's an intangible something. Maybe it's Jesus, I, I, can you help me change my desire? Can you help me change my dreams? Can you help me change my skills, my giftings, my talents? Can you help me change my reputation, my knowledge? Can you help me change that? Listen, these things are not inherently bad. In fact, they're morally neutral. But if Jesus Christ is not Lord over all of your life, then he is not Lord over any part of your life. There is one throne in your life and you don't get to sit on it. It's his. He is king. Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. That's what you do to kings. You bow before them in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There is no mark of real estate anywhere in all of the cosmos that is excluded from this. Everyone will bow the knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If that's not enough, Paul keeps going in Colossians 1. He says, he, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. All things, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head 
of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead. That in everything, in everything, he might be preeminent. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. And he gets to sit on the throne of your life. That's why one touch from God changes everything. That's what the one thing this man knows. He was blind, but now he sees. And not just physically sees, he spiritually sees. Like that's what the Greek in this moment says. The word for sight here is blepo, which means that he, he doesn't just see what's tangible. He sees what's true. That's what the hand of God does in the, per, in the life of a person. That's what one touch can do for you tonight. It can change everything. It can erupt your rhythms. It can disrupt your plans. And it can lead you into deeper, fuller, more lasting life than you'll find anywhere else. Than you yourself will ever lead yourself unto. You see, Jesus Christ, he is the son of God. He is the hero of heaven. He is the light of the world. He is the prince of peace. He is the Messiah, according to this text, that was sent to save. And for this man, and God, I pray for you, no amount of interrogation and no amount of intimidation could ever sway his allegiance from this king. Jesus is God become man that man might come to God and no cost incurred in this world is worth the riches of all he affords even the cost of being cast out which is where the story finishes like at the very bottom paragraph of this text it says that the Pharisees, they can't make sense with this guy. And so what they do is they cast him out. There's a really detailed explanation of what that kind of casting out means, what that sort of excommunication looks like according to Pharisaic tradition. But for the sake of our time, what you need to know is he is cast out in such a way that it's only modern day equivalent is death. He's removed from the synagogue. That's what verse 22 tells us. He's removed from the Jewish community. That which he has wanted to be a part of. And he at last has a chance to because he has his sight. He loses it. He's removed from it. He is ostracized from community. He is cast out of society. He is alienated and alone, left forbidden on the fringe. No one else wanted him. And Jesus says, I want you. You may be cast out, but I'm closing in. And as he engages this man, he looks at him. And he says, hey, do you believe in the son of man? To which this guy responds, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him, but who is he? And I can just imagine Jesus sitting face to face with this guy, staring into those eyes which now can see. He says, you've already seen him. And it is me that is him. Friends, don't you know that Jesus Christ has done for him what he wishes to do for you? He wishes to engage you tonight, wherever it is you are. Meet you in that place that you might see him as he is. For that is what he has done in descending from heaven above, coming to earth below, meeting us here, fallen, broken, bruised, broken, and busted humanity meeting us in our 
death that we might see him in his life and receive that for ourselves too. You see, Jesus, he wants for you what he wants for this man. He wishes you to know your life is so complicated, but I bore that complication upon the cross that it might clarify your vision of who it is I am. And Jesus wants you to know, just as this man does himself, that one touch from God can change a person forever. And Jesus Christ is the gracious hand of God extending to those who feel so far off and yet will be brought home should they place their faith in him and follow him heavenward. Friends, don't you know, Jesus is the one who has come near to be cast out that we who are cast out might come near. This is the heart of our King. This is the one thing to know. If you're blind, tonight you can see. One touch, it changes everything. How badly do you want for that touch tonight? Let me pray. Father, I just thank you. I thank you, God, that in moments like this, you come close to meet us. People from all walks of life, an assortment of backgrounds, God, you come close to meet us here in this moment and yet to teach us that, tr that same truth which we all need despite our diversity. which is that one came for all, that all might be united as one under his name. Father, I pray that you would move in this moment, that your Holy Spirit would come and would sweep amongst us, that you, God, would have your way amongst my friends here in these seats. God, there are some people here tonight that want a fresh touch from you, that want a touch from heaven. I pray, God, that you would reach down and you would meet them where they are and you, God, would lift them to where you yourself sit tonight. Others, God, they're here and, and God, what they need is humbling. I think about the Pharisees in this story and they have so much line length and, and page work, God. And yet what we see from their example, God, is that spiritual arrogance leads to spiritual blindness. I pray, God, that for those in the room that may in fact know you, they would say, Jesus, I'm blinder than I thought. Would you light up my life, give me a new sight, and lead me in the way everlasting? For others, tonight, God, is a night of salvation, that they might look to you and say, Jesus Christ, be the Lord of my life. I've reached the end of myself. I am desperate enough to follow. It's not what do I have to lose, it's what do I have to gain. And it's you, my God, that I wish to gain tonight. Save me from my sin, forgive me of my iniquity, and lead me home that I might be with you forever. This room is yours. This people, they're yours. Would you sit on the throne of our life, God, we pray in Christ's name.